Hello, this is Dr. Hana Asil, and this is Unit 6 in um, January 2023 of the Pearson Edexcel uh, International A Level Chemistry. Let us take a look at these questions. Of course, Unit 6 is dealing with practical skills in chemistry. So the first question here says solution A and solution B are aqueous solutions. The compound in each solution contains one cation and one anion. The cations are different, but the anions are the same. Both solutions are green. Give the formula of three cations, which could be responsible for the green color. Of course, colored means it is transition metal. Now, which transition metals give green solutions? You should remember. Vanadium 3 plus, iron 2 plus, nickel 2 plus, chromium 3 plus, all of these form um, green solutions. So uh, you could write the um, ions V3 plus, Fe2 plus, Ni2 plus, any three of them, or you could write it with the complex. Uh, water structure, so V, water 6, 3 plus, and so on. So these are the cations. There are four of them. You could choose any three that give green color. A student added dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide, drop by drop, to samples of each solution. Initially, a green precipitate formed in both solutions. More aqueous sodium hydroxide was added until the sodium hydroxide was present in excess. The precipitate produced from solution A was insoluble and turned brown on standing. So what would be the formula of the green precipitate from solution A? Which one would form a green precipitate? And then on standing, it turns brown. That would be the iron 2 plus, because iron 2 plus with sodium hydroxide will give a green precipitate, insoluble in excess. So A was insoluble. But if it stands, it is oxidized by oxygen in the air, so it becomes iron 3 instead of iron 2, so it turns reddish brown. Then he says the precipitate produced from solution B dissolved to give a dark green solution of C. Give the formula of the species responsible for the dark green color. The one that will form green precipitate that dissolves when adding excess sodium hydroxide, that is the chromium. So this is chromium 3 plus. So you either write it as um, uh, chromium with the six ligands to the OH, and that is a total of three minus, or just write the formula. He wants the formula CrOH6 with a three minus. Remember that the chromium here has an oxidation state of plus three, but we have six OH minuses, so the overall charge on this uh, compound is three minus, on this ion is three minus. The student added hydrogen peroxide solution to C and warmed the mixture, which turned yellow. The yellow solution was boiled to remove excess hydrogen peroxide, cooled, and then pure ethanoic acid was added drop by drop. The yellow solution turned orange. State the type of reaction involved. What is he doing? We said C is the chromium OH63 minus that was green. Now, if we add hydrogen peroxide to that, it uh, changes into the chromate ion, and the chromate ion is yellow. And then when we add acid to the chromate ion, it becomes dichromate, which is orange. You should know this. So. The chromium in the OH6 3 minus is a chromium plus 3. Um, when we add hydrogen peroxide, it becomes chromate. The, cro the chromium in the chromate ion is chromium plus 6. And that means this is an increase in oxidation number. When it turns from green to yellow, this is oxidation. 
Then he's saying identify by name or formula the ion responsible for the final orange color. We said if I have the chromate ion, you add acid, it becomes the dichromate, and that is orange. So the formula of that is Cr2O7, 2 minus, or it is called the dichromate ion. Pure ethanoic acid is corrosive. Identify the appropriate control measure to reduce the risk associated with this hazard. Assume the student has carried out the addition in the fume cupboard, is wearing safety glasses and a lab coat. What else should he do when dealing with something that is corrosive? Of course, he should wear gloves. Then we say, describe the corrosive hazard label. You are required to know the hazard labels. So which of these is for corrosive? He says, describe it, um, and you may use a diagram. So this is the corrosive hazard label. So you can either describe it to test tubes uh, with drops falling on hand and uh, falling on uh, metal, or you can just draw this hazard label. Please be familiar with the hazard labels. The student attempted to identify the anion present in the green solution A. The student added dilute nitric acid, a few drops of silver nitrate to the solution. Now, the first thing you're going to ask yourself, nitric acid and silver nitrate is a test for what? Of course, this is a test for halides. He got a Pale precipitate, which the student thought might be white or cream. Remember, we said um, one of them, chloride, should give white, bromide should give cream, iodide should give yellow. And sometimes it is difficult to tell is this white or cream. So he's saying, first of all, identify by name or formula two anions which might give this precipitate white or cream, chloride or bromide. And then he said the precipitate formed was separated from the mixture. Aqueous ammonia was added. Describe how this test allows the student to distinguish between the two anions. Now, to distinguish between chloride and bromide, first we added dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate. Chloride should give white, bromide should give cream. And then we add aqueous ammonia. When you add aqueous ammonia, the precipitate from the chloride dissolves in dilute ammonia. Now, the precipitate in the bromide, if you add dilute ammonia, it wouldn't dissolve because it dissolves only in concentrated ammonia. So if we add dilute ammonia, chloride precipitate will dissolve. The precipitate from the bromide will not dissolve. It will dissolve only in concentrated ammonia. Explain why with solution A, the precipitate must be separated before adding aqueous ammonia. Remember, we were saying that the precipitate in solution A was a green precipitate because this was iron 2. If I leave it as it is and go on and test with the aqueous ammonia, I'm not going to see anything. So the solution A had iron 2, this formed green precipitate, and this did not dissolve in excess ammonia, so the change in the silver halide precipitate will not be seen. So if it is a precipitate that will dissolve or will not dissolve, that will not be clear because I already have a green precipitate that is not dissolved. Question 2 says the reaction between tertiary halogenoalkane to chloro to methyl propane and hydroxide ions to form 2 methyl propane to all is shown. The progress of the reaction can be followed by titrating portions of the reaction mixture with a solution of hydrochloric acid of known concentration. So we're reacting the halogenoalkane with sodium hydroxide, for example, and then I'm going to titrate it with hydrochloric acid to see how much of the hydroxide has been used up. So, the procedure was a flask containing 250 centimeter cubed of an ethanolic solution of the halogenoalkane with concentration 0.1 was placed in a water bath at 25 degrees Celsius. 
a similar flask containing 250 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide with concentration 0.1 was placed in the same water bath. So he has the solution of the halogenoalkane in ethanol and the solution of sodium hydroxide. And uh, both of them were at 25 degrees Celsius. The temperature of each solution was allowed to reach 25. Seven conical flasks were prepared, each containing about 50 centimeter cubed of propanone. The reaction was started by mixing the two solutions from the water bath in a large flask. The flask was returned to the water bath. A timer was started as the solutions were mixed. At intervals, 25 centimeter cubed sample of the mixture was transferred to a conical flask containing propanone. The time was noted. Each sample was immediately titrated with a solution of hydrochloric acid of concentration 0.05 using methyl orange as indicator. Okay, now give the expected color change at the end point. He did what? He added it to a base sodium hydroxide solution and he was titrating it until we reach neutral. So my methyl orange should change from yellow to orange. Explain the effect on the volume of hydrochloric acid required if the titration was not carried out immediately after step four. In step four, he added he was adding it to propanone and then titrating immediately. Remember that he adds it to the propanone to stop the reaction. But the propanone does not stop the reaction completely. It slows it down. So the volume of acid that I need from the burette will be smaller if I leave the solution for longer time. It will continue to react. Explain how the use of aqueous ethanol in the reaction mixture allows the reaction in step three to proceed at a relatively fast rate. Why is he putting um, ethanol? He put the flask with ethanol and then he added the solutions so that there is ethanol in the flask. Why is he using ethanol? The ethanol would dissolve both reactants, the chloroalkane and the sodium hydroxide. So this allows them to mix together easily and this will cause a faster reaction. Then he gives me a table of results and he's saying plot a graph of the data using the axis given. So he has these data, of course, we distribute the numbers on the X and Y axis, we plot in small X's, and we join with a line of best fit. Half-lives for the reaction. How do we get two successive half-lives? He's starting at about 25, or I can extend the curve to 25. And if I'm starting with 25, half-life is the time taken for half. The amount. So I'm going from 25 to half of that is 12 and a half. So this takes how long? This took about 1750 seconds. The second half life would be from the 12.5 to half of the 12.5. So that also took 1750 seconds. And that tells me that the half lives are constant. Now, state the order of the reaction. How do we determine the order of the reaction? Remember that if it is first order, the half-life is constant. The first half-life is the same as the second, same as the third. So that is first order. If it is a zero order, then the half-life will decrease with decreasing concentration. If it is second order, the half-life will increase with decreasing concentration. So what happened in our graph? The half-life was the same, it was constant, so this reaction is first order. Question three says, moss in lawns can be treated with lawn sand, a mixture that contains sand and a double salt ammonium iron two sulfate. The percentage by mass of iron two plus in the mixture can be found by titration with a solution of potassium manganate of known concentration. So he's putting 4.5 grams of lawn sand accurately weighed in a 250 centimeter cubed conical flask. The sample was shaken with 50 centimeter cubed of dilute sulfuric acid and he's telling me this is excess. 
the resulting mixture was titrated with potassium manganate of concentration this and it needed a titration volume of 40.35 centimeter cube. First, he's asking states what would happen if the uh, in the titration if the mixture was not acidified. Remember, when we're using potassium manganate, the mixture should be acidified because in presence of acid, the manganate will be reduced to manganese 2+. But if there is no acid, what it happens is it will change into manganese dioxide, which would form a brown precipitate. Neither hydrochloric acid nor nitric acid can be used to acidify. Why is that? I cannot use hydrochloric acid because the chloride ions will be oxidized by manganate ions to form chlorine. So that will interfere with the reaction. I also cannot use nitric acid because nitric acid would oxidize the iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus. Then he says the ionic half equations for the reaction of iron 2 ions and manganate ions are shown. Calculate the percentage by mass of iron 2 plus in the sample of lone sand. First of all, when you have two half reactions like this or half equations, you should add them up in order to know the ratio of moles between the manganate and the iron 2 plus. So how do we add these up? Remember that in order to add them up, I have to cancel the electrons. And that means if the second equation has five electrons, I have to multiply the first equation all through by five so that I can cancel the five electrons on both sides and then add up everything on the left before the arrow and everything on the right after the arrow. So that final equation is my final equation, overall equation. Calculate the percentage by mass of iron 2 in the sample. So what does he tell me? From the uh, instructions, he had 4.5 grams of lawn sand and he used what? Uh, per manganate of concentration 0.02 and the volume was 40.35 so I can get the number of moles of manganate concentration times volume please do not forget to divide the volume by 1000 this gives me the number of moles now I look at the equation in order to get number of moles of iron 2 I can see that from the equation one mole of manganate reacts with 5 of iron 2 so that means that the number of moles of iron 2 plus would be the moles of manganate times 5 that gives me the number of moles of iron 2 what does he want he wants mass mass of iron 2 would be number of moles times mr so that is 0.225 grams but he wants percentage how do we get percentage the mass of the iron 2 over the total mass of the long sand which he gives up there 4.5 times 100, that means I have 5% iron 2 plus. The titration is carried out using the apparatus shown. At the end point, the solution changes to a permanent pale pink. Remember, when we have permanganate in the burette, at the beginning, the flask, the solution in the flask is colorless. As I add potassium permanganate, uh, the pink color from the permanganate from the burette will disappear. And then my end point is when there is a permanent pale pink color, when the pink color from the burette no longer disappears. To repeat the experiment, the burette is refilled with potassium manganate. Procedure carried out again. Give three ways in which a titration is carried out to give the most accurate possible burette reading. What should we do during the titration? He's saying, assume that the equipment is the same. The burette is clamped in a vertical position. The titration volumes are read at eye level from the bottom of the meniscus. What else should we do? You should remember that when we're doing titration, you should put a white tile below the flask to see the color change clearly. Swirl the flask to mix the contents during titration. Add the permanganate from the burette drop by drop when we come near the end point. So these are some precautions when we're doing titration. The compound of two ethanoyl aminobenzoic acid can be prepared by the reaction of 
to amino benzoic acid and ethanol chloride. So he's saying add five grams of the two amino benzoic acid, few anti-bumping granules to a dry 100 centimeter cube pear shaped flask and fit a reflux condenser. Do you remember what a reflux condenser looks like? So we're putting the reactants in the pear shaped flask. We have a condenser placed vertically on top of it and we're heating. Add 10 centimeter cubed of ethanol chloride by pouring it slowly down the condenser. Gradually bring the mixture to boil, heat under reflux for 15 minutes. Allow the mixture to cool slowly. Add 10 centimeter cubed of water down the condenser. Heat the solution slowly until boiling. Allow the solution to cool to room temperature. Collect the crystals of 2 ethanol amino benzoic acid by filtration under reduced pressure. Recrystallize the impure product from a mixture containing equal volumes of ethanoic acid and water. So, the first question says, give two reasons why it's often necessary to heat a reaction under reflux. Sometimes we heat under reflux. That means we put a condenser vertically on the pear-shaped flask. Why do we use heating under reflux? First, we need to heat, usually to increase the rate of the reaction. And then we put the condenser on top so that any volatile reactants, alcohols or whatever we're heating, should not evaporate, escape, because if it evaporates, then it's cooled and returned back to the flask by the condenser. Explain why in step four, water is added slowly. Where is step four? He says, allow the mixture to cool slowly and add 10 centimeter cubed of water down the condenser. This is because the reaction is vigorous. So if I add the water slowly, this will prevent rapid effervescence of the HCl gas because the HCl gas will be coming out vigorously. I don't want it to um, jump out of the a condenser and so on, so we have to add it slow. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus used for filtration under reduced pressure. He's saying filter under reduced pressure. How do we do that in the lab? We don't use a normal filter paper and funnel. We use something called a Buffner funnel. This is uh, actually a sort of a ceramic funnel with porous base, so it has. Uh, holes at the bottom and the filter paper is placed over the holes. The round filter paper is placed at the bottom of the funnel over the holes. And all of this is attached to a pump so the pump uh, pulls the uh, solution through the Bachner funnel so this is called filtration under reduced pressure. The melting temperature may be used to confirm the identity of crystals. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus you would use to measure the melting temperature. Okay, we want to measure the melting point of something. This apparatus is called the Fields tube. It has paraffin oil and I'm heating the paraffin oil so that um, I am seeing the rise in temperature. I'm looking at the solid in the capillary tube. Can you see we have the solid in the capillary tube? It has been heated. And as the solid uh, melts, then we can take a look at the temperature in the thermometer. So this is called a Fields tube. State how this melting temperature determination would show that a pure sample has been prepared. How do I know if my sample is pure? Of course, if it is pure, it will melt at a sharp melting point. And that melting point will be the same as that of a data booklet or the same if I check it with something that I know is pure. Show by calculation that in the preparation 10 centimeter cubed of ethanol chloride is excess compared to 5 grams of 2 amino benzoic acid. So this was my reaction. I'm reacting the ethanol chloride with the 2 amino benzoic acid and he's saying I'm using 10 centimeter cubed of ethanol chloride Five grams of two amino benzoic acid show that the ethanol chloride is excess. So I need to calculate number of moles of each 
And from the equation, the number of moles should be the same. So whichever one has higher number of moles, that is excess. So how do we calculate number of moles of the ethanol chloride? He gives me density. You should know that density is mass over volume. So I can get the mass of the ethanol chloride in the 10 centimeter cubed of a sample that he's using. So that mass is 11 grams. So here I have the mass of ethanol chloride. I can get the number of moles. Number of moles is mass over molecular mass. So this gives me a number of moles of ethanol chloride. Now, try to get the number of moles of the other reactant. I have a mass of 5 grams and MR that he already gives me. So this gives number of moles of much smaller than ethanol chloride. They should be 1 to 1, but obviously the ethanol chloride is higher than what we need, so it is excess. A student carried out the preparation using the amounts of reagents given in E and obtained a yield of 56.7% of the product. Calculate the mass of product obtained. Okay, so we know that the number of moles of the product should be the same as the number of moles of the reagent that was not excess. So that is 0 0.0365 moles. And that means if I have the MR of the product, I can get the theoretical mass of the product. So the mass is the number of moles times the MR that I calculated. So theoretically, I should get 6.53 grams. But he's saying his yield is only 56.7%, and that means the actual yield is 56.7% of what he got, and that is 3.7 grams. That's the end of the paper. Thank you for listening. Please share, like, and keep listening. Thank you.